Hello, and welcome to another episode of Skeptic Hangout, the show where we have conversations about social issues with a skeptic perspective. Joining me today are one of two of my favorite people to work with, and I'm so honored to be able to share this stage. We have Richard Gilliver and Kelly. Well, today's topic, this is something that's very personal, near and dear to me, and I thought I would get some ideas on this, and it is about local government. Now, and, and and I I think this is especially interesting because I have no idea what local government looks like in any place other than the United States. Yeah, and and is is it any different in different areas of the United States? Because the United States, uh, for someone who's not from there, is quite big. I mean, you, you, <laughs> you literally, I think if you drive from one end of Texas, I, I worked this out with a, a friend from Texas. Uh, the other day and i think if you drive from one end of texas to the other and back to the middle you've literally driven the full length of britain from top to bottom <laughs> and 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 that's just one state and you know that you know i think in in that perspective your local governments and of course each state has independent laws as well in in some respects, so your local governments are going to be, I would think, uh, wildly uh, different to, to between themselves, even as as that one might be between yours and ours here in Britain. So it's going to be an interesting uh, uh, conversation for sure. And uh, you know, I, I don't know how far you guys are away from each other, Kelly and Puck. Uh, Not uh, very. Actually, no. <laughs> we are, are the states that we live in share a border, a very small one, yes, but we yes, share they a border. Do. Yes, they um, do. So it's, it, it's it's another interesting facet of this that we can live as close as we are and yet still have very, very different local governments. Uh, yeah. The city I live in, for example, um, it, it's uh, it's a very old city as far as the United States is concerned. And it didn't start out as one big city. It started out as a whole bunch of little towns separated only by a couple of miles. Now, of course, back then, w- without the transportation we have now, a couple of miles might have been a substantial journey. They had the space to spread out and say, OK, we are our own individual town. As transportation and technology improved, the city grew and absorbed all these towns. But even now, literally 400 years later, you will still have very strong senses of local identity. You will see people wearing shirts that say, I live in Oakley, not Hyde Park. <laughs> even though, like, if you look at a top-down map of, of, of Cincinnati, you couldn't tell where those are if you didn't have the boundaries. And if you were walking down the street, you can't tell when you cross one from the other. But they have very different local government systems. The town I live in is less than one square mile. It is surrounded on all parts by parts of Cincinnati. But my city has its own tax structure, its own municipal code, has its own school district, it has its own police department and fire department, all for one square mile. Wow. So that, that's that's another fascinating uh, aspect of local government. Just how local are we talking about? Yeah, so so is, is, is this, I mean, I am completely clueless on this, so, you know, I may be completely wrong. Is it, is, do you have, like, local government, then state government, then federal government? Is that we kind do. of how it works? Uh, yes, and it, it branches out even more than that. We have county government here mm-hmm. in, in, in Ohio, and I see Kelly nodding. So there are some things that are dealt with on a county level and, and not a state level. <laughs> so yes. uh, what, what's what's it like where you are, Kelly? Yeah, it's very, it's very probably very similar to yours. I'm sure there's some some little minor rules that are different. I was involved with local government in the state of Illinois before I moved to Michigan. I've been involved with it here in Michigan, and honestly, it works pretty much the same. But there, like I said, there are a few general rules that are different. So, I I think in general, most of the United States works in basically the same way. Although, like I say, there are going to be a few differences. 
So, but uh, you're, but, and you were right to mention the county government, Richard, our, our states are divided up into counties and the counties are then divided up into cities. So where you're, you'll have a whole, a whole group of uh, cities and a lot of outlying countryside that'll be part of a county that all falls under a county jurisdiction too. And just to confuse our foreign audience just a little <laughs> bit more, county is different from federal congressional district. Uh, so just because you live in the same county as somebody else doesn't mean you live in the same congressional district. That's you could true. be living literally across the street from someone and you're voting for different representatives in Congress. Yeah, so, so that's absolutely true. Is it is it the case then that and and I'm taking this knowledge completely from old seventies movies. <laughs> so, uh, this is how well informed I am. Is it the case then that if you were to cross a uh, a state line or even a county line and being in pursuit by the local constabulary, the they they would stop having jurisdiction once you'd cross that line? Or, no, or, no, right? Okay, no, that used to be that way. But all they got to do is they, they can they can follow a fugitive if they're chasing them. And uh, usually the police in the jurisdiction they're going into will not have a problem at all if they do that. And they will generally call ahead and let them know we're moving. I'm I'm chasing somebody and we're moving into your jurisdiction. I'll never so watch that, Smokey the, the and the Bandit jurisdiction- the same again. Yeah, right. So, but, but it used to be that way. And that that is actually the reason why the United States formed the FBI was that a criminal could cross state lines and get away. And then the FBI was made to go after those people who had crossed the state lines. So. Um, and, and this is especially relevant with me because um, uh, Cincinnati is right on the Ohio River. And just on the other side of the river is Kentucky, which is a whole other state. Right. Um, the more interesting thing is if you live in one state and work in another state, now that your 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 taxes uh start getting really really interesting because you have to pay to both jurisdictions. So, wow, that's yeah. ooh yeah, and, and all for what is re- kind of an arbitrary boundary. Because again, if you if you didn't know anything about what the states were shaped like and you just looked at Cincinnati from the top down, you would look at Northern Kentucky and think, you know what, that looks like it's all just part of one big city, but it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's its own state. Uh, Newport and Covington, which are the towns across the river, again have their own government, their own school district, and their own uh, their own little ways of doing things. So, so, um, so, it, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we'll get into the subject proper, so it doesn't just turn into like a, a radio interview. Um, uh, so, is it is it the case then that like you might have laws where in in one state, let's use a very black and white example, so not complete overcomplicate things that in one state you can might be able to buy alcohol when you're 18 and in another you've got to be 21 yes but no because the whole united states is now 21 (laughs) but yes that that is the case and we're seeing that now with uh, medical cannabis and recreational cannabis where it's legal in some states and not in others Uh, that would probably be a better example in this case because uh when um, Ronald Reagan was president back in the 1980s, he blackmailed all the states and told them that they would withhold uh, federal highway funds unless they raised their drinking age to 21 and all the states complied. So the drinking age throughout the entire states now is 21. Right. Now, where that is still a topic of discussion is age of consent laws, where even as recently as the 90s, there were a couple of states who were still hanging on to 14 as the legal age of consent for sexual activity. (laughs) Now, I I can't think of any that don't have 16 now, but 16 and 18 is still a separation, and there is still some separation for different types of sexual activities. So um, depending on what state you live in, (laughs) it may be permissible for 16-year-olds to consent to sex. But if you go across the street, now we have a problem. <laughs> yeah, that, that I can see how that might be problematic, <laughs> especially now, for, uh, for fathers. <laughs> now, I have a question for you. What is a council? Uh, a council is, is so we, we, the city I live in, has a city council, and they are the people who uh, misspend the government's money. <laughs> when when it's given to them, especially in, in, if if you have a look in my city, if you literally, I mean, I was glancing, I was doing a bit of browsing through Facebook earlier, and I was literally just browsing through, and I think I saw about three or four different posts 
about uh, the city council where I live, where the the people, it was just complaint after complaint about after complaint about the way they were misspending money. The the, no. the 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 city council where I live is essentially just the killing the city centre, the killing literally killing the city. So in in kind of Britain, we have like city centres used to be the big thing for shopping. Used to go to the city centre for like, mm-hmm. like your main main like, areas of shopping, clothes and whatnot. And and those are just well the one I live in. I was going to say it's not true that those in general. Because if you go to cities like Birmingham or Leeds or Manchester, uh, cities of comparable sizes to the one I live in, you, you get the, the thriving. And then you go into my city centre and it's just, it's horrendous. Everything's just, and it's just, it's just mismanagement by the local council. And, it, you know, I think it's renowned for being terrible <laughs> it's, re- no. it's it's renowned for it but yeah do you elect the council members or are they uh, no we we do elect them yeah we we okay. get to we get to have lo- we have local elections and and get to choose who we want to misappropriate the funds <laughs> <Go ahead and give. laughs> well you know this is this is the the thing that i i and why i strongly support um, involvement in local government is because um, to win a U.S. Rep- House of Representatives seats, you need tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of votes, right? To get voted to the Deer Park City Council, you probably need about 400, depending on the seat and who, and who the incumbent is. Um, so it's much easier to participate with your local governments. Finding an audience with the U.S. Supreme Court, unless you're in you know, one of the very narrow channels, is almost impossible. But every third Monday of every month, uh, you can walk into the Deer Park City Council meeting and be heard. And it, it, it shocks me how many people want to be politically active, which is good, but couldn't even tell me when their city council meets or what congressional district they live in. Um, the phrase that I like to use is like, no matter what's going on with the, the federal government, really, the only thing that tells you is whether the wind is going to be in your face or at your back. But it's really the local government that has a lot more say in what your immediate community is going to be like. Mm-hmm. Like the issue of like, not to bring this up because I'm can of worms, um, but um, uh, bathroom bills, right? Those are not settled in federal court. Those are handled at the municipal level. And those are where the real changes happen. And that's what's going on in your community and where you have a better chance at affecting your community. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And that's like I said earlier, I was involved with local government in Illinois and again here in Michigan. And I encourage people to get involved because it really, really does have an effect on your life. You can vote for the president. You can vote for... uh, uh, you don't really vote for prime minister, but you, know, you get the idea that 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 elected person who's head of the country is not affecting your day to day life as much as the mayor or the the uh, the alderman from your city is. They're, they are really affecting your life way more on an everyday level than a, a president or a senator even or even just your local uh, house representative, which would be, I think, your uh, house of commons, Richard. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh... I like that we have to translate. It's like we have to go back and forth. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We have to go from Congress to what Parliament is? Is that yeah. oh, over here? Parliament is a brand of cigarettes. Well, so our house know. to their house of common to our house of representatives to their house of commons and our Senate to their house of lords. Right? Does that make sense? I think so. Yes, I, I think I, I'm following I, you. I have reading to do. That's that's yeah. all I'm taking over this. I have reading to do. All, 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 the Senate my, my, is all the millionaires and the billionaires. My my wife has a degree in politics. I'm just not going to let her listen to this episode. I'm just going to pretend <laughs> it doesn't exist. No. Um, but this so, is. So go ahead. Ask your question. Let, let's get to the kind of nitty gritty then. And how much? How much uh, does the uh, does the local government? Like influence everyday decisions because if we have, if if I wanted to kind of build a, a new property or even in some cases have an extension or do any kind of major changes to to my land, I would have to put a notice up for uh like for local residents on display via the council for them to register their displeasure if they have any with those plans and and they could then go to the council and say you know we don't want this to take place and then if if so there was so much opposition i wouldn't be allowed to do it is that the same kind of thing there 
Yeah, um, this is Similar. especially uh, interesting with places of worship because they have to go through that also. So if and this happened in in Anchorage, Alaska, I'm going to say almost 30 years ago, where they were going to build a new Mormon temple, but it was in a residential area. So they did have to uh, post in city council, and they did have to take a uh, to you know take uh, complaints from the neighbors saying you know what do we want this kind of building nearby? And I think you, you can go uh, on on YouTube and find many instances of people who want to build a mosque and it gets immediately shut down in these city council meetings yeah mm -hmm. and then there's different like like in, here in, in in where i live in deer park uh you can only build certain kinds of buildings in certain places and depending on the city council, they can get super particular about what they allow. For example, in 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 Deer Park, uh, one of the city ordinances is that we do not allow large franchises here. Okay, we all are, we're all locally owned businesses, and it looks like your heart's in the right place because you want to support people who are you know your your you you want to support your neighbors who have a hair salon and not not great clips, right? But now the downside of that is it's very difficult to encourage people to move here because there aren't a lot of jobs for them here. So, you know, it's like you have to decide what you want to do. And it has far reaching effects because it's... Amberley Village, which is about two miles that way, has decided that they don't want any public transportation stops in their town. So now this affects all of Cincinnati's public transit system because they're not allowed to have any stops in Amberley Village, which is pretty big. That this franchise thing is a, a big concern up here where I live, where a lot of the smaller towns are trying to keep these big chains out because they want to keep the small town flavor. But our population has been growing over the last couple of decades, mostly by people who are moving here from more urban areas that want to have these chain stores brought with them because this is what they're used to. And now they're running up against the local. The, the, the reason they moved here was because of the small town charm. And now the very same people want to get rid of it are fighting to get rid of that small town charm, fighting with the locals who want to keep it. So do, it, it's, a, it's a big concern up here right now. Do you, do you have in situations like that in those kinds of places? Because we certainly do here. When somewhere is small and kind of desirable like that, there's, there tends to be uh, people moving in and buying lots of second homes, buying old, you know, homes from people who've who may have passed on and when they with when the villages and whatnot have got a an aging population and they're very desirable. So the young people are priced out of the market. So you kind of get people coming and buying holiday homes to or holiday homes so they can let them to people. Uh is is that a similar kind of problem there that has a lot of local opposition? It it is a problem. It's not quite like that, but there are a lot of people who do come here and buy up the older homes. They use as second houses and summer homes. We have um, a lot of industry up here in this area was in mining and it all closed. It was all closed down by the mid eighties. So we literally have towns up here that are half ghost towns. We have towns that are ghost towns. All the businesses are gone. There's still people living in the houses, but half the houses are only full in the summertime because they're owned by some lawyer downstate, right? So that that is definitely something that's happening here. And it's something that a lot of the people that live in this area year round do not like to see happening, but there isn't a lot of money in this area. The kids are not priced out of the homes. They're still priced reasonably, but they can't get a good enough job to make the money they need to purchase the house. And that that's the problem here. There, there just isn't any business. Yeah. And that's another uh, artifact of, of small towns and, and small city councils is it's, it's much easier uh, for uh a, a developer to grease the right palms and get the right permits and to secure a lot of less desirable land to, uh, you know, at, on the cheap and then demolish what's ever there and put up whatever it is that they'd like to do. And, you know, they have city council members who are, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go so far to say, but on the payroll, but uh, definitely uh, who are incentivized to support such, uh, uh, such things. It's a lot easier to do that in small towns than it is in big cities. And you see it happening quite a bit. I'm not going to go so far to say that there's anything desirable in Deer Park, but uh, uh, <laughs> so we don't have those kind of problems of people wanting to buy out the property so that they can uh, uh, put uh, the kind of housing they want here. Uh, it sounds like we have completely different problems in our, in our local governments, Kelly, but this is oh, the advantage definitely. of local government. 
because we live just a couple hundred miles apart, but we face very different problems and we're so, we're serving very different people. So it makes sense that, uh, you know, we're handling these issues like your your sound town's answer to, to a problem might not be my town's answer, but it makes sense that they shouldn't have to be the same. Which is which goes to show you the importance of each ha of each of us having our own local government, because mm -hmm. e e even if we do have the same problem, we're not always going to have the same solution to that problem because of the geographical area we live in and the demographic area we live in. Yeah, so how does that work in in and you none of you may be able to answer this. I'm not sure. How does that work in one of the kind of huge cities like New York or L.A. or somewhere like that? That that's that's just absolutely off the scale, massive. How does local government work there? Are they, are they split up into their own di districts as well? Yes, they can be. And even Deer Park, a small town like this, is split up into two different districts. So there would usually be a representative who comes from each different district to represent the interests of those districts. Uh, so it is still just one council representing all of Cincinnati, but those council members are all coming from uh, uh, different regions within Cincinnati, which is actually shockingly small when you when you look at it on a, on, a, on a map from top down. But yeah, um, since they're serving so many people, just like the House of Representatives, uh, it they decide the number of, of city council based on population uh instead of well this is a city so you get nine mm -hmm. and i know in chicago they call them aldermen where i would like to go like participation is so huge that's um, where and, i wanted to go yeah the the other thing that you don't even really think about with local government is your school board OK, and even if you do not have an active student going through your school district, you are still affected by that, by what goes on in that school. So it is absolutely to your interest, even if again, even if you don't have kids in the school district to attend these local school board meetings and uh, school board officials are elected in a lot of the cases. And a lot of the decisions that get made about curriculums and uh, after school programs uh, are are decided at these school board meetings where they encourage public participation. I don't remember who said it, but. The decisions are made by the people who show up and mm -hmm. small governments and local governments are exactly the perfect place where you should show up to make your concerns heard. So, right. so would it be the case in a, in a, sorry, Kelly, would it be the case in, in a district where you kind of have a, let, let's say you have six or seven schools. The, the, is, is that served by one school board, which makes Sometimes. a decision for all of them? Depending on the size of the city, yes. Like when I was in Anchorage, the Anchorage school board had jurisdiction over the seven area high schools. Deer Park right. is so small, they only have one high school. Uh, and then even then, there's the county education seat, which will make uh, larger decisions based on that, which typically gets fundings from the state school board. <laughs> so and, and, it, it, it trickles down. But curriculum is decided at the local level. And then now in my town, the school district has three schools they oversee, an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school. And all three all three of them are in the same building. Wow. So <laughs> Uh, Deer Park has two elementary schools, so we're, we're, well, it it just like we're a little bit bigger than you. Different. I wanted to point out the differences because there you, you did mention it depends on where you live. And mm -hmm. that, that's a good way to point out the differences is that actually illustrate how how my area is different from your area. Yeah. With, and, within... and then just. Just a short stone throw away. Cincinnati Public Schools has over forty high schools in their jurisdiction. So, mm -hmm. yeah, right. Wow. Right. Wow. I was I was just going to say within within probably two miles of me, I think there there are uh, five what you would call elementary schools, uh, just within like a two mile radius of where I live. So I think. Uh, <laughs> Oh, and depending on where you live, we're we're still not even taking private schools into consideration, which largely ignore uh uh county and state borders and are are like the, the Cincinnati Christ, uh, Catholic schools are run by the Cincinnati Di Archdiocese and not necessarily by uh Cincinnati City Council. Although they have a say in education, uh, it's the Archdiocese that actually runs the schools. Yeah. I, I don't know how it works over there, Kelly. How how does how, how I, do, I would, do religious schools work there? I I. The, yes, those are run by a diocese too. That that don't run by the church. I would, Richard said that about the five schools and in right real close to him. I started thinking. I think there might be five schools in a thirty mile radius. Five yeah. elementary schools in a wow. thirty or thirty or forty mile radius of where I live. So, but I live in the middle of freaking nowhere. That's yeah. I had, I always have to tell people that where I live is there's more trees than people. So, for every person, we have a hundred trees here. 
Yeah. And I, and I live in sandwiched in between other, uh, we'll call them wealthier cities, right? So Sycamore high schools are much better funded than Deer Park high schools, even though, like I said, literally across the street is Sycamore Township and I'm in Deer Park. And if if I had a student going to a school district and my neighbor had one, we might be going to completely different schools, even mm -hmm. though we can we can see each other from our houses. Yeah. And uh, one big problem in is uh, the decisions get made to remain separate uh, uh, government entities. But now that's the, the trickle down effect on that is that schools are very vastly differently funded. Mm -hmm. And so the quality of ed education can suffer just because you're on the wrong side of a city line. Right. Because a lot of it depends on the tax base of the community that the school district district is in. A, a wealthier city is going to have better schools. And that's that is a distinct problem within our system, within our local government system, that the schools aren't all evened out, that we do let the let just the local people control it. And we have that. Um, what's the word I'm like? We have that problem with the schools being so different where you have one that's way, way below expectations and one that's way above expectations just because of the area that they are in. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we also have that. Does, does, uh, does the kind of the tax vary within a certain, uh, district then? So, yes. so where I, where I live on one side of the city, you might have a vastly different tax code to on the other side of the city. And mm -hmm. and is, is that the case there within the kind of, because your local councils maybe have different rules and different things, is that still the same thing where one council might impose higher tax on a, what we'd call a postcode area? Yeah. Yes. Um, and and again, it stops at, at the city line. So um, uh, so uh, the city council might decide, for example, on a levy for uh, renovating the parks. Right. Um, and that would only be the people who reside in Deer Park who would vote on that particular issue, which uh, and again, there are people who live close to that park, but technically live in Sycamore who don't get to vote on that. <laughs> so yeah. it, it, it gets it gets really messy really fast. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can, I can imagine that seems really complicated. I, I mean, I do, want, I do want to say something because Puck mentioned the school boards, and I this is something that's going on in the United States right now, and I think it's really important to mention this. Uh, the Proud Boys, if anybody knows who they are, they're a right wing militant group. They have seen the school boards as a way to get their feet into politics, and they have been running candidates in school board for school board positions all across the United States. We have a proud boy candidate on my school board in my town right now. It is something that, as Puck was saying, you know, you should go run for your school board. Yes, you definitely should go run right now to keep people that are these extremists such as these people from running our schools and deciding what is going to be or not going to be taught to our children because it's going to have a huge impact in the future yeah so I, not I'm just sorry I, I didn't mean to get political but no. i wanted to get no no, no. There. i mean we're, we're talking, talking about, about government by <laughs> definition it's going to be no but uh, the nra is another group that does this nra is a very small group of people compared to the population in the united states but they know where the meetings are and they know how to be heard in the public sphere so they are very loud in the places where people need to be very loud uh they 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 know you know they know when these meetings are and they're going to go and they're the ones who are heard even though they are in the vast minority they're the ones who show up and the decisions are made by the ones who show up yeah that that is a, a problem when uh you've got people who who can't can't show up in some cases mm -hmm. uh, even even if they want to and mm -hmm. uh i think uh again it, and i think this is probably the same for all three of us uh those who who already have the power who want to kind of uh, make decisions will uh, make it easier for those who are of like-minded status to to kind of join them and uh, and help that that come those things come to pass that they want to come to pass. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I want another thing I want to point out if that you do want that if you do want to get involved in local politics. It is not hard at all. There are probably a lot of positions down at City Hall right now that need to be filled. My town is looking for people all the time. 
And it's not for political offices, but for planning committees. We have all kinds of planning committees. We have a committee that operates the local historical museum. We have a committee that plans the local town festival every year. And these are all things that you can get involved in. They, if you want, do want to get involved in politics, this is a great place to start. It's a great place to get your name out there. It's a great place to meet the pay people that you're going to be working with. If you do want to go into a career in politics, it's, it's a wonderful place to start. You don't need any money to do it. You just got to show up and do it. And you don't even have to be elected to do it. You just got to show up. So, See that sound? That sounds awesome and scary all at the same time. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, 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 it's awesome because it, it makes it. I think it makes it accessible for people who, who might not have that uh, access otherwise. I think it's scary because it also makes it accessible for people who you might not want to get in there. Uh, democracy. And <laughs> right, and so my mantra has always been. And and I I get it that I'm I'm in a privileged enough position that I can make it so that I can go to my my city council meetings when they happen. Um, is that government is not something that happens to you? It's something you're expected to participate in. Um, and local governments, especially small town local governments, is a wonderful place to do that. And it's surprising, I think, because we have this stereotype of a, a local government that that owns everything and there's such a small, closed, insular group of people that make decisions based on their own interest. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people on, on city councils, on school boards, genuinely want to hear from their constituents and are curious enough. It's like, we want to make the decisions that are right for you, but we don't know what you want or need unless you come and tell us. So, so that's why I'm, I'm such a huge proponent of being active. Um, if you want to be politically active, just like Kelly said, uh, your local government is a fantastic place to start. That's and it awesome. is, it's super, super accessible. Yeah, that really, really is awesome. Uh, okay, so we're, we're kind of winding down to the end of the show. Uh, let, let's let's start kind of wrapping it up and giving uh, final thoughts of uh, you know anything else you want to say before we we end it. My big one is show up like as, as much as you can. Uh, and, and, and you know what? You might find that these city council meetings are dead boring for the most part. OK, they're they're talking about zoning and they're talking about licensing. They're talking about which potholes to fix. It is dead boring for a lot of it. Uh, but if you have something you need to talk about, they're going to listen to you. So find out where these are. Find out your local city council. Find out your local school board. Find out who your uh, your what congressional district you live in. Find out who your state representative is. Learn all this stuff because you can affect things in a very big way just by showing up. Yes, and, and and being active too. Uh, you don't maybe you don't want to hold an office, but you're still interested in what happens or what the person who is holding that office is doing. So go out there and campaign for somebody to help get them elected. That's another way you can participate without actually being a part of the government. There's always ways that you can get involved in changing the world around you. And even if it's just putting in an hour or two every week, every little, I say it all the time, every little candle lights a dark corner of the world. So go out there and be that, that, that little candle, and light up your little dark corner. Be it a little candle. Uh, absolutely wonderful advice. It really, really is. Uh, I think, and this has turned more into an me interviewing you two show <laughs> than I, uh, I, enjoyed I anticipated it, I it being uh, to begin with. Uh, it's certainly been a very interesting and very eye-opening one. Uh, of uh, You know, I think all all three of us, myself and Kelly, still are kind of active on the nonprofits and Pug's been on there before. And and you know we've talked about uh, you know school boards in the US countless times, and it's it's really kind of it, it's it's changed my opinion somewhat from a very negative one that I might have had before to to um, you know maybe a more enlightened one having this conversation. So that it's really been helpful for me to just kind of sit here and and kind of be the interviewer <laughs> if you like for the day but it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation it's very different to the the ones we've had over the previous couple of weeks and you know well, you know let's keep them coming if if you want to uh give us your opinions on on kind of local government and local councils in the area you live uh please go along to our facebook fan discussion group and and get involved in the conversation 
And, you know, maybe you're outside both the UK and US and you have a completely different system of, of local government and local councils. And, you know, please share uh, your insights. I know, we, I know we've got people who listen to the show who are based in Australia. And I'd be very interested in in knowing what their opinions are on their local councils. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for listening. As always, we will be back next week uh, with some different hosts. Uh, we, we are on rotation. We will have, uh, and I'm not sure who's on next week, but we will have either or or both Josh and Laura back with us. They haven't gone anywhere. They were, they were just not in the rotation for these last couple of weeks. So, yeah, we're very excited to have Josh. Welcome Josh and Laura back. And we will see you again very soon. Thank you very much for listening.